Today's teardown is an all too familiar engine here in the shop. It's another Mazda 2.3 liter MZR. It's a direct injected four cylinder found in the Mazda Speed 3, the Mazda Speed 6, and the Mazda CX-7. And this engine I have a story with. I know the miles, I know why it's here, I know why we're taking it apart, I don't know what we're gonna find, so I'm not gonna ruin everything. But this actually came from a vehicle I bought that was a trade-in at the local Mazda dealership. I bought a 2006 Mazda 6 that ran and drove with 134,000 miles from uh, a dealership. It got traded in, it's actually where my brother works. And I decided to part the car out because it is ridiculously rusty. Like, it looks like it sat at the bottom of the ocean for years. It's the rustiest Mazda Speed 6, and those cars are inherently rusty, especially here in the Midwest. This car was terrible. It also has low compression in cylinder two or three. I didn't do a compression test on it. I think it's cylinder two. Uh, it has like 30 PSI in that cylinder. So it ran poorly, had misfire codes, and uh, I bought it for a pretty good deal. We parted the car out, we did all right on it, and now it's time to part the engine out because that's where most of the money in those vehicles is. So we're gonna get this thing completely torn down. We're gonna find out why it's got low compression. Hopefully it's nothing catastrophic. And uh, anyway, let's get started. First things first, let's get the plugs out and see what they look like. Well, right off the bat, they're the right plugs, so that's good. But you can see the three of them are pretty a little on the lean side, they're not really that tan that you like to see. And then one of them, pretty black, pretty bad. And the gap is really bad on this plug. And these look a little bit better, these look a lot better. Uh, looks like this one's about three times the gap that the other ones are. Something was going on with that cylinder. This car was lightly modified, it had an intake and, and I think they're called boost pipes or had a silicone uh, charge pipes on it, but otherwise the car was bone stock. Next, we're going to start prepping the intake manifold so we can get that out of the way. Why are these always like this? O ring. Dipstick tubes are like my arch nemesis. <sighs> okay. Just gonna hang out like that. Before we get too many bolts out, we're gonna get the crankcase vent hose off of the intake so that doesn't hang us up and then we're going to work on the fuel pump stuff over here So this is cylinder one, this is the one with the wet spark plug, and it's pretty wet in there. All of them have some buildup, but the cylinder one is wet, it's like sopping wet. Ironically, this is not the cylinder that had low compression. Next, I'm going to go ahead and fire the nuts off, wait, I'm going to remove the nut, that still sounds wrong. I'm going to remove the fasteners that hold the exhaust manifold to the cylinder head. Well, you can see that cylinder one is very wet. Actually, some of whatever this is, oil and gas, I think, uh, is actually coming out of the cylinder. The rest of them are pretty dry. They look about normal, but cylinder one definitely has a problem. Next, we're gonna start on the fuel pump. Get that out of the way. Let's get the feed line off while it still bolts it down. Oh. 
Okay then. Let's just not light any matches for a little while. That looks okay. Oil looks decent. I don't see any major wear on the lobe that drives the fuel pump. Now we're going to get the valve cover off. Well, it's not unreasonably dirty in here. I can't really tell much until I pull the cam caps, but it doesn't look awful. I've seen much more sludgy engines. Now we're going to turn this engine over and see uh, when there's the most slack between the intake and exhaust cam, see how much slack there is. If there's too much slack, that chain will make all kinds of noise. Uh, these chains are known for stretching and they will actually make contact with the valve cover. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty excessive. These don't have like a bridge tensioner or anything. The only tensioner is down here on the timing cover. And then there's a guys you'll see when I get the timing cover off. I wish I could say I was surprised, but I've seen this so many times. I've, I've probably torn down 150 or 200 of these engines at this point. And this definitely isn't the worst I've seen. And as I predicted, there's some wear marks on the valve cover. It's actually grooved in that ridge right there. And that's from the timing chain making contact with the valve cover. That should never happen. Oh. 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 I'm okay. That O-ring right there. And I think I've explained in videos past, but the cams and the crank are not keyed on these engines. So they've got a tool that locks the back of the cams, both the intake and exhaust cam, and then there's a plug on the back of the block. You remove the plug, and you insert the tool, turn the crankshaft to where it stops, and then you align the bolt on the crank pulley with the bolt on the timing cover, and that simple process is how you time it. It's really not that bad after you've done a bunch of them, but the first time can be rather daunting. Anyway, let's go ahead and get the timing cover off, get the crank pulley off, and we'll see what the timing system looks like. Pretty varnished but not terrible. Because the crank is not keyed, the timing chain tensioner is not always a good indicator of how stretched a chain is, but you can see that this tensioner is completely extended. And that could have been because the slack was on this side as soon as I took the tension off of this bolt, which keeps this timed. However, it's been my experience that you usually don't get this much movement in one of these engines, not like this. The rest of this looks just all right. It is pretty dirty in here. I don't think they change their oil super often, but I certainly have seen worse, especially on CX-7s. Next, we're gonna peel the timing chain and components off so that we can start pulling the cams and get the head off. Save that for later. And what the hell, while we're in here, let's see if we can get this apart. That was not as planned. Nope, we'll do that later. Now we're gonna get the cam caps cracked loose, zip those out so we can get the cams out and take a look, see what those look like. Some 
definite signs of oil starvation in that journal. It's not every single journal, but most of them, I'd say. There's a the, there's the groove right there. I can feel all of these with my fingernail. Classic oil starvation on an MZR. Let's go ahead and get these cams out and look at the actual cylinder head. Not too much wear on the journal, although I'll be honest, most of the wear is usually on the cam cap just because of the direction of force from the valve springs. But it doesn't look too torn up. I think the head's going to be okay. I looked at the caps, they all look about the same. All right, now we're going to try to crack these head bolts loose. This is always a good dance because my engine stand doesn't have locking casters because I never think about buying a new one, even though I probably should. Okay, now it's time to pull the head. Well, the cylinders one and four look really good. Cross hatching is very visible. I don't see any vertical gouges. Let's turn it over and look at cylinders two and three. It turns over really nice and easy. Well, cylinder three definitely has some issues Looks like it's a little, got a little hot right there. And the rest of the cylinder looks okay. The cylinder looks nice. Yeah, it all looks pretty good. Looking at the head, there's cylinder one, two, three, and four. And something I noticed about cylinder four, see the edge of that valve, it looks like it's a little melted or burned. It looks like it's got a burned intake valve. I don't know what would cause that damage, but there's definitely something that protrudes in the edge of that valve. Now I will admit that uh, once my guy found the low compression situation, he stopped. So he did not do a compression test on the entire engine. And also this vehicle was condemned by the Mazda dealership themselves. And they said it had low compression in one cylinder as well. The question is, what cylinder are they talking about? Something else to note here is the cleanliness or lack thereof of injector number three. Why do you think that's so much dirtier than the others? Do you think it's got an injector seal that's gone bad? Now it's time we flip this thing over, make a mess probably, while well, it's not on me. Oh, this was strained. Mind you, it was at some point. Even though it doesn't really look like it, Before we get started taking the pan off, I'd like to point out the drain plug. This is not what it's supposed to be. I have not seen this before. I've seen a magnitude of things uh, with varying degrees of success. But this is a new one. Nope, I'm supposed to not do that, I guess. So. I don't know what the point of this is. It's, a diff it's an odd drain bolt. But the threads are nice, which is what I usually see damaged. Now here I thought I was onto something, finding the wrong drain bolt, or maybe a stripped out drain bolt, but no. And meow, it's time to pull the oil pan.
The inside of the pan looks pretty decent, but I did find this one little piece of it's like RTV. I don't know if that's what that is. That could have also come off when I pulled the timing cover. Oh, that was a bad idea. Why do I play these games? I don't know why I'm like this. Okay, that didn't work the way I wanted it to. Idea number two. And by doing this, I can get all the bolts out and the chain off likely. Yeah, look at that. Next, we're gonna get the balance cartridge off. Before we go any further, I want to talk about the oil filter housing. This is what most people switch out to a spin-on filter. The Gen 1 MZR engines had this cartridge, which, oh, I mean, it leads to so many issues. A lot of people don't like them. I don't know of anyone that actually does like them. I think they did this to reduce environmental waste as far as changing a whole filter. This time, you're only changing just the cartridge. But ultimately, it created more problems by destroying people's engines. Now we're going to crack the rod caps loose and pull the rods and pistons out. Bearings show some wear, uh, especially in this cylinder. There's some grooves and you can see the copper starting to come through. It's not the worst I've seen by any stretch, but definitely had some wear. Now, I'll be honest, I looked at every piston expecting to find damage. And damage I did not find. I looked at every single one of these. and nothing. All right, now let's go ahead and get the crank out. The main bearings all look pretty good. There's a little bit of wear, some scratches, not anything too terrible. The crank is definitely a serviceable part. It'll likely need polish. There's a few grooves. I can't really feel it with my fingernail, but it will need polishing before use. But I'm pretty happy because the crank is a very expensive part of this engine. Here's another look at that block. And I wonder what caused that. I didn't see any damage on the piston, so that's good but there could be a problem with that bore that might require some machining. The rest of the bores look pretty good. I don't see, it. there's no major damage. It's just that one right there. And I think that's the one that had low compression or I, that's what I've been told. This is a comparison I've been waiting to do for quite some time. We are gonna compare the two liter Ford EcoBoost and the 2.3 liter Mazda MZR, the engine I just tore down. I did an EcoBoost tear down a couple weeks ago. If you haven't seen that video, Go ahead and watch that. But I wanted to compare the timing components because that's a very sore subject for the 2.3 liter Mazda variant. And I'm talking about the turbo version, not any of the non-turbo versions. Those are totally different. But the turbo versions have notorious problems with the timing chain. I've heard of chain stretching. I've seen it. We saw examples of that today. Uh, we've seen VVT actuators go bad. Uh, lots of timing jobs at the dealership. You talk to any Mazda dealership, any tech that's been there from the late 2000s and later. They've almost all done timing chains on CX-7s especially, and even some of the speed cars. 
And I don't know if that same thing is true for the two liter EcoBoost. I don't have enough experience. The, la the first one I tore down was the engine I tore down a couple of weeks ago. So I don't know if that is a problematic part of the two liter EcoBoost engine. However, you can see some major differences in design between the two. And now these, again, these are the same family of engines. The MZR was the first version. The EcoBoost, I don't know if it's second, third, I don't, whatever. The EcoBoost has significant different design for the timing chain. As you can see, this is the silent type of chain as they call it, and this is a roller chain. Now, you can also note the difference in contact patch from the chain uh, on the sprocket here and here. Now this is the MZR and this is the EcoBoost. And this is the chain from the MZR and it has some play in it. And that's pretty much how these chains stretch as they develop play in the links. Now this doesn't have near as much play in it, but again, this is a much newer engine. I, I know that the EcoBoost, this two liter had uh, 170,000 miles on it. It was well taken care of and obviously this 130,000 mile Mazda engine was not. But all, all things being equal, the design is very different and I'm not sure if it's the design or if it's the uh, lack of maintenance, the apt for lack of maintenance on the Mazda engines that creates such a problem or maybe we're just not seeing the EcoBoost with issues just yet. I'm quite happy with the way this teardown went. It went extremely smooth with the exception of the dipstick tube, those things always seem to get me. And this engine was an absolute mess. It had a little bit of every problem I see on these engines. It had tons of slack in the timing system. We saw damage on the valve cover from the chain making contact with that. Uh, there's a little bit of bearing wear. We saw valve damage and a burn spot on the block. I think they covered all of the bases. I don't know what happened to this engine. I can tell you it was not well treated. It was driven hard, put away wet, uh, I hate that saying so much because if it was put away dry, it would have spun a bearing. Anyway, this engine is extremely rough, but all of the parts are in serviceable condition. And that is a very important thing to me. I get a lot of questions about what the value of these parts are. What can I sell these parts for? How much money do I make? Well, I didn't buy this engine. The car parted out and I've already made my money back. So anything I sell from this engine is strictly profit, but I counted on that when I bought the car. Now these engines in a perfect scenario of everything is perfect, part out for between $2,200 and $2,400, which is about what you can buy a decent running engine for. There's not a lot of engines that are like that. However, this with a little bit of crank damage, a little bit of block damage, again, these are serviceable parts. They're just gonna require a little bit of machine work time. I think I'll get somewhere around $1,900 to $2,000 for the parts from this engine which is pretty good. I'm pretty content with that. If I bought one of these vehicles from the auction and I counted on that engine being good and it turned out it had a dead cylinder, okay, not a Viper dead cylinder, but like a dead cylinder like this engine had, it's not a huge loss, a few hundred dollars and I get a video out of it. So it's not really a loss at all. Now, if it shot a rod out the side of it, like many of these engines like to do, that's a totally different ball game. If you'd like to buy parts off of this engine or any of the other engines I've torn down, I'm going to leave my email in the video description. And as always, I love all the comments, all the feedback, and even the criticism. I love it all, and I'll catch you on the next one.